Shalom and welcome to Shikol Da'at. I'm Rabbi Josh Rose. This week, we close out the book of Genesis with Parashat Vayechi. I want to quickly look back at some of the themes of the whole book of Genesis to shed light on our Torah portion. So, where does Genesis begin? Of course, at the, begin- at the beginning. Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim ve'at There's only God at this point, the creative force and no other. God's presence shapes the chaos creating beauty, order, the proliferation of life, a harmony among all the parts of the created world. God completes creation in chapter 2 and then blesses it. We'll come back to this later. And almost immediately the world goes wrong. It is human beings who undo the harmony and the order created by God. First, Adam and Eve, the eternal pair, break their bond with God through deception. They are to then suffer, as a consequence, the pain of labor, in both senses of that word, and expulsion from Eden. What follows is a legacy of the undoing of God's work. Their son, Cain, murders his brother, Hevel. Over generations, the world is consumed by violence that mirrors this act. And then the flood. In the Noah story, many hints in this text, which we can't go into here, indicate that creation itself is being undone. It's as though God needs to create the world anew. And by the time the end of the Noah story passes in chapter 9 of Genesis, with its mysteriously shameful episode of drunkenness and a hint of sexual violation, we begin to see that family is a central concern of Bereshit. The family is the central narrative and moral unit in the book of Genesis. In each generation, though, we see family trauma and pain. But now, after the story of the flood, the story changes fundamentally because we meet Avram. This extraordinary figure is able to hear, amidst the noise of ordinary life, the voice of God to discern a spiritual moral order within the world. What makes Avram worthy of his new name given by God, Avraham, is that he also understands his place and the place of his spiritual descendants in realizing that spiritual moral order, in manifesting the divine dream of harmony and peace. God has a true partner in creation and establishes with Avraham an ongoing relationship, but more important, a breit, a covenant that binds God to Abraham's descendants and binds them to God. Those descendants, you and me, and all who will eventually join that covenant are to be blessed by God and are to make themselves a source of blessing to all the people of the world, as God tells Avraham. And then... Real life intrudes on this beautiful vision. Abraham's son and grandson, Isaac and Jacob, do indeed carry on this relationship with God, but the familial theme rises up continuously to disrupt their lives. Again and again, families are torn asunder by pain and division. Isaac is tricked by his son Jacob, leading his other son Esau to want to kill Jacob. Jacob is then deceived by his uncle Levon into marrying the wrong woman and is mistreated by him for years. Along the way, interlopers and foreign leaders add to the complications, and by the time we are introduced to Abraham's great-grandchildren, that is Joseph and his brothers, the specter of fratricide appears for the third time in Genesis. The progenitors of the Israelite tribes throw their brother Joseph into a pit, intending to kill him. And then they lie to their father, saying that he's been torn by a beast. This initial familiar murderous betrayal casts the family into exile. And then finally, in our Torah portion, Vayechi, Jacob and all of his sons and their families and Joseph are together in Egypt. This book that began with God's perfect cosmic harmony sustained on earth by those who were to build in the land of Israel a community of peace and blessing concludes with a deeply divided family living in exile. Descriptively, Vayechi is our story. We live in a fractured world, wounded by our own family stories or suffering the divisions of the broader human community. We live in exile, far from a perfected world and far from our spiritual home. 
But let's look back again at that creation to see how we got here and what is the true meaning of this ending of the book of Genesis. God begins creating with light. The Torah indicates God's own assessment of the work that God saw, as in God saw that it was good. Rashi's opening comment on our Torah portion, by contrast, talks about blindness. Ours is what's known as a parasha satuma, a closed Torah portion, which means simply that it does not begin with a line break, as most Torah portions do, but rather it begins right in the middle of the paragraph where the previous Torah portion ended. So when you're just looking at a Sefer Torah, it, it can be very hard to find where this Torah portion begins. And Rashi, citing a Midrash, says, Why is this Sidra, this Torah portion, closed? Because when Jacob died, the eyes and the hearts of Israel were closed because of the suffering of slavery, which they then began to oppose on them. That is, which the Egyptians would begin to oppose on the Israelites in the coming parasha. So, in contrast to God's light and God seeing his creation, we begin our Torah portion with a sense of blindness, a spiritual darkness that, that overcomes the Israelites. And that's not the only evidence of lack of light or the absence of seeing. Jacob's eyes, the Torah tells us, are dim with age in this week's Torah portion, a blindness that is accompanied by his own spiritual failure to see. When Jacob gathers his sons towards the end of his life, he says, and, his, and Jacob called his sons and said, Come together that I may tell you what is to befall you in the days to come, or literally, at the end of days. Imagine gathering your children with this incredible uh, promise of some kind of prophecy. You're telling them where things will head. But he does not reveal any such end leading the commentators to tell us that this sort of divine vision had been removed from him. Rashi, offering an alternative explanation for why this Torah portion is closed, says with regard to this moment, He wanted, that is, Jacob wanted to reveal the ultimate end to his sons, but it was closed from him. Again, we begin with light and with seeing, and now we begin the last Torah portion of Genesis with a kind of closedness, a blindness, an absence of light. Between Bereshit, the beginning, and Acharit HaYamim, the final end, we behold only confusion, chaos, and disappointment. Over the course of this parasha, Jacob dies, and the book closes with the passing of his favorite son, Joseph. This book that started with the prolifer proliferation of life ends with death. And we know that this hints only at more death to come. In Exodus, when the Israelite babies are drowned in the river Nile, we know we have come as far as we can from Gan Eden, from the Garden of Eden, watered by the four supernal rivers that our Kabbalistic tradition tells us flowed with spiritual sustenance. And yet, Beneath the surface of the Torah portion, we begin to detect echoes of that initial divine harmony, forces moving in the opposite direction, back to order and beauty. Let's look again at that moment where Jacob gathers his sons. He gets them together so he can bless them. Jacob called to his sons, and he said, Hey, Asfu, come together that I may tell you what is to befall you in the days to come. This verse that we just looked at a moment ago. Hekabtsu, assemble and hearken, O sons of Jacob, he continues, hearken to Israel, your father. Can we hear in this coming together with those verbs, heasfu, come together, and hekabtsu, assemble? Can we hear the, in this assembly of the sons who in their travails have been physically and emotionally divided, an intimation of a fitting cosmic healing and bringing together? God creates a world by delineating and separating. The verb lahavdil, to divide or to separate, appears repeatedly in the creation story. It's also the root of the word havdalah, the ceremony with which we close Shabbat. 
perhaps in this drawing of his sons together in blessing, this gathering of the diffuse pieces of his family, Jacob's mirroring the primal divine harmony. Delineation, separation, is the primary creative act of God. And this primary divine act we reflect back through a life of mitzvah, which is so often based on the recognition of appropriate distinctions, holy from profane, kosher from not kosher, Shabbat from the ordinary. And perhaps we see in Jacob's gathering of his sons, in a, in, in a circle of beauty and harmony, some intimation of this proper alignment of pieces that are separate. And Jacob's spiritual act resonates on the earthly plane. Upon the death of Jacob, Joseph's brothers know he might harbor resentment that he could now unleash. They come to him and they plead. He weeps and he embraces them, assuring them of his love. Genesis, this book, as I said, is so defined by familial division and estrangement, but it ends now with what appears to be a true and beautiful moment of fraternal healing. Let's look closely at that blessing that we keep talking about, Jacob's blessing of his sons, which, which occupies such a prominent place in this Torah portion. In fact, Jacob's blessing of his grandchildren and his children is the focus of the first five aliyot of Vayechi. After he blesses them, the Torah says, Kol ele shivte Yisrael shnei asar, v'zot asher diber lehem avihem v'yevrechotam ish asher kivichato berachotam. These were the tribes of Israel, twelve in number, and this is what their father, that is Jacob, said to them as he bade them farewell, addressing to each a parting word appropriate to him. Jacob then instructs them to bury him in the land of Israel, teaching us and his sons that the covenant with God is still very much in place. It has not been forgotten in spite of the distance we've come spiritually and geographically. This dream of a healed world inspired by commitment to God will not die with the last patriarch. And then, Vayachal Yaakov l'tzavot et banav, ve'asof raglav el hamita, ve'igva ve'asef el hamav. Jacob completed instructing his sons, drew his feet into the bed, and expired, and was gathered to his people, in the Torah's uh, well-known euphemism for death. This beautiful euphemistic description of his death contains words that we might suggest resonate with the creation story. When Jacob instructs his sons, Litzavot, we hear the special verb from which mitzvah comes, letzavot. Genesis is bookended also then by this word, which appears for the first time at the beginning of the creation story. I should say actually at the end of the creation story, in the beginning of the book of Genesis, where it says, Vayitzav Hashem Elohim al ha'adam lemor mikol eitz hagan achol tochel. And God commanded the man, that is Adam, Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden you are free to eat, but as for the tree of knowledge of good and bad, you must not eat of it. For as soon as you eat of it, you shall die. So in our Torah portion and at the beginning of the book of Genesis, this verb, letzavot, to command, Jacob commanding or instructing his sons, and God issuing that word for the first time, commanding Adam, with this word, Lutzavot, so central to the human divine relationship, we are taken back at the moment of Jacob's death to the very first mention of death. Does Genesis close with the reminder or the promise that even in death, we should be reminded of the eternality of the divine promise? Perhaps. The final sentence about Jacob's final acts begins with the word Vayachal. The word means to complete and indicates the fulfillment of a project, or in this case of a life. It speaks to the beauty and the fullness of Jacob's journey. And where do we first encounter that word, Vayachal, which ends Jacob's life? Well, it appears twice in consecutive verses at the end of the creation story. Vayachulu hashamayim v'ha'aretz v'chol 
the heaven and the earth were finished or completed in all their array. Vayachal Elokim biyom hashvi melachto asher asa vayishbot biyom hashvi mekom melachto asher asa. On the seventh day, God completed the work that God had been doing, and God ceased on the seventh day from the work that God had done. And these words, which we chant each Friday night before Kiddush, conclude this way: Vayavarech Elokim et yom hashvi. God completes Vayachal creation and then seals it with a blessing in the phrase that I just said in Hebrew. God blessed the seventh day. Jacob blesses his children and then Vayachal, his life is complete. God completes Vayachal creation and he seals it with a blessing. Now, with these tentative observations about the echoes between the creation story and this last Torah portion in the book of Genesis, I don't want to draw any sweeping conclusions about the literary intent of the holy book of Bereshit. But we should focus on the ways in which hurt and hope, pain and possibility, and of course exile and redemption are woven together as Bereshit draws to a close. Vayechi is too complex too complex and magnificent for us to try to label it as a happy or sad ending to Genesis. But I guess with these observations that I'm making about the possible resonances and echoes between the beginning of the book of Genesis and the end of the book of Genesis, I'm trying to point out something significant about what I really do think is built into this last Torah portion. The twists of the story, we are to see all of the dangers and all of the difficulties that await the Jewish people in exile, as well as the heavenly hope that instills in us the knowledge that redemption is possible. Jacob's life and his death reverberate with the promise that in our very lives resonates the vision of God's promise of a world of beauty and blessing. We look to Yaakov Avinu because he, through the missteps and then the corrections in his life, takes the steps to bring together a world that was divided and to bless his children into making that world one that will continue in covenant and in promise with divine, seeking once again to restore the divine order that at one moment brought us all into being. And so too is our task. Through a life of mitzvah, through a life of Torah, through a life of gemilut chasadim, acts of goodness, we are to confront a world of exile, a world of chaos, and to restore it, restore to it a sense of divine beauty and harmony and blessing. Have a great week. Thank you so much for listening.